myself before we get started. More fun with a new friend. Okay. That's like the perfect, perfect 30 second friendship. All right. Let's, let's come back. This is that kind of audience. I hope you guys are like this when it comes time for live audience questions. That would be good. Well, in extremely exciting news, you are actually at only the second event to take place in this auditorium. That is, worth, that is worth a round of applause. We are freshly moved into our brand new home at 110 The Embarcadero. We're 114 years old and we've been renting. So this is really nice. We're incredibly excited and it's really possible because of donors and members and volunteers and attendees like you. So thank you for showing up and giving us a reason to build a brand new building. Anybody's first time here at the club? So for people who don't know, we are a nonprofit. So we can only do this, and by this I mean more than 400 programs a year, with our members and our donors and our volunteers. So membership includes perks like discounts on tickets to events like this, advance notice of very exciting events like our sold out program with Sir Richard Branson next week, lots of other benefits. So if you're interested, we've got front desk staff happy to talk, or you can check your emails tomorrow for a little discount code on membership. Other great things coming up, October 24th, actress and entrepreneur Gabrielle Union at Marines Memorial Theater. October 25th, entrepreneur and startup expert Eric, Rice, Eric Reese. November 2nd, State Bird Provisions on their new cookbook. And on November 9th, we're hearing from the artist and, artist and writer of a graphic novel about drone warfare. So we really cover all the bases here at the club. Now tonight, like I said, all of you talkative folks better have questions for Lila and Laura. So in the last 15 minutes, there's a microphone at your back left. You'll hear Laura give you a reminder and you can start lining up. If you're not familiar with questions, they're short, they don't include personal stories, and they end with question marks. So Laura's a professor. I have a feeling she'll crack down if you get long-winded, so just keep that in mind. We are live streaming tonight on Facebook. Uh, for any of your friends who couldn't be here, please feel free to share it. We are at Inforum at the Commonwealth Club on Facebook. We'll be live tweeting. Lila and Laura's handles, as well as ours, are on the screens to your right and left, so please chime in and who you really want to hear from, I would love to introduce to the stage. Please welcome Lila Jana and Laura Tyson. Good evening. It's really nice to be an inaugural event in such a lovely space. I, I've been in San Francisco a long time, and when I first came years ago, I did do numerous things with the Commonwealth Club, so it's lovely to continue that tradition. Um, I'm a, it's a great pleasure to serve as your moderator tonight. Um, we have an outstanding and inspirational leader, entrepreneur, uh, CEO, and uh, founder of Samasource, a nonprofit organization, but also CEO and co co-CEO, I guess, and founder of LixMe. Do you, is that how you say this? It wasn't clear to me whether you use the, the uh, acronym or, okay. Um, and uh, so we're here today to talk about her work in both areas and also to help her launch her a new book, uh, which we have here. Uh, I am married to a writer. It's very important that we buy books, uh, so <laughs> I will be I will be buying a book, <laughs> and uh, I hope that uh, we'll we'll get a preview of what's uh, in the book in our conversation. Uh, so, following the discussion, there will be a reception, and there will be books available. Uh, there are so many questions that one could ask Lila. She has accomplished so much in such a short amount of time. And just in my conversation with her backstage, she's already thinking about next steps <laughs> and, what, and what she can do. So she's a great inspiration. I want to start with the, the company that you first founded, the one that gets uh, a lot of attention, deservedly so, and that is Samasource. And I, I really want to just start with um, if you were doing an elevator pitch to describe Samasource and its mission so that everybody has the kind of sense of what it is 
that this is trying to do. Can you, can you give us that? Sure, and I have my head of communications right here in front, so this is a <laughs> live judging situation. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Sama means equal or balanced in Sanskrit, and our mission is to connect low-income people to work through the internet and move them out of poverty. And we do that in uh, a really interesting way. We work with large data services uh, or large technology enterprises mm -hmm. to provide data services, things like image tagging um, and other content services that boost their product offerings. So we are now, for example, doing um, the image tagging that powers uh, self-driving cars uh, mm -hmm. for a, a few prominent automakers. So, so given that mission, you have to link up to a number of uh, different organizations. You have to link up, you have to link to the individuals who you want to help find these jobs. You have to find them, train them, link them too, and then you have to find all of those other organizations and their jobs. So talk a little, and you're using the internet, so talk a little bit about uh, the challenges or the way you go about that. How do you find a set of jobs and how do you find the people that you want to help train? Sure. Well, I'll, s I'll start on the side of the people that we, that we help train. So I got into this. I had been working in Africa for many years and, and studied development economics and felt like the most powerful way to help people was to give them living wage jobs. And one of the best ways to do that in the modern era is through technology, mm -hmm. because all of a sudden you have a way to connect someone living in a very poor part of the world with a job in a rich part of the world, which means that they can make a lot more money than they could make doing anything else selling to a local market, right? Mm -hmm. So theoretically very powerful. So I, I thought to myself, what if I created a company that only recruited people who came from very poor backgrounds? which is obviously an unusual recruiting criterion. <laughs> <laughs> Might right. even be an illegal recruiting criterion sometimes. Um, in our case, we, we only recruit people who make less than 2 or $3 a day. The average income of all of the workers at SamaSource is, uh, is about $2.20 a day, mm -hmm. which means that prior to working with us, they are, if they're employed at all, it's in the informal economy doing things like literally working in a quarry, b breaking big rocks into smaller rocks. It's like an actual job that someone had before mm -hmm. Samosaurus. Or selling stuff by the side of the road. Or we have another worker who used to literally b brew a local kind of moonshine and sell it on the street to make a buck fifty a day. So these are the sorts of jobs people have before joining us. We recruit them and we partner with many local nonprofits. There's a, okay. an abundance of them in, mm -hmm. uh, for example, the slums of Nairobi where we work. Mm -hmm. And we train in basic computer skills. And then of that group, we, we pull some people in to work for us full time. Okay. On the other side, here in San right. Francisco, here are the companies yeah. who are. Mm -hmm. uh, our sales team cringes sometimes when I like get into the details of our workers' backgrounds because the the story they pitch to our clients is we are a, you know, a very high quality data services firm. We provide training data to the best companies in Silicon Valley and to the most advanced machine learning uh, teams working at the forefront of of technology. So, for example. Um, the worker that I mentioned who used to brew this moonshine trains people to tag images for one of the most prominent auto companies uh, in the country working on self-driving cars. And, uh, and that work, believe it or not, um, we can train someone to do in a relatively short period of time because we've broken down these big technology projects into small units of work. So that's how it works. So our, our front-facing operation here in, in the Bay Area is focused on high quality, um, delivering results, you know, being a really competitive enterprise. And then on the back end, it looks very different from what people might imagine in the sense that we're only recruiting people from very poor backgrounds to do the work, okay. and we're paying living wages along the way. So when you, uh, the, the, your, your outward-facing links here, so these companies have big projects. They have lots of ways they might source labor. I assume most of this labor that's being sourced is being sourced on a project basis. These are not long-term employment contracts. They're basically to do projects. So why would they, what's your pitch for why they should come to you? <laughs> there, mu there must be other ways you can source this kind of talent. 
Sure. Well, I used to say, fight poverty. Oh, and get your work done. And that <laughs> obviously, that didn't work very well for most product managers in the Bay Area. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so luckily, I, I got wise enough to hire better salespeople than me, who um, who sort of educated me on how we win these contracts. And and so our, you know, the first value proposition we put forward is we are the highest quality service provider. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, when you hire people from marginalized backgrounds, I think especially people in the areas where we work. They've had no other formal work opportunities, and they take yeah. this extremely seriously. Mm -hmm. They will show up early to work. They are, interestingly, like people often ask, isn't it hard to train people from these backgrounds? How do they even show up? The least of our problems is our workforce. Okay. It's incredible. I mean, these are the most motivated people. They're incredibly loyal to an employer that's willing to um, quickly pay, um, you know, far and above what they'd make doing anything else. And so as a result, quality is something that we can sell as mm -hmm. a major, you know, attribute. Mm -hmm. And we don't really, you know, the, the social mission piece comes in after we've convinced the client that we offer the best, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the best services. In terms of cost, we're, we're not the cheapest option, mm -hmm. but increasingly for, for someone who's in charge of developing the next self-driving car algorithm or developing um, you know, a smart chip for your phone to recognize faces and images, that person is more concerned with quality often than cost mm -hmm. and wants to make sure that the data that's going into training this algorithm is good data. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's how we win. And I actually think that's what most social enterprises should focus on rather than selling the customer on the social mission, we often talk about it as like the Trojan horse of oh, social impact. You have to sneak in the social impact or the sustainability. Um, and it's a, it's a nice to have, it's the icing on the cake. That's, that's, that's a really interesting point because uh, you also in, in your work talk about the importance of, and it's a term I think I've not heard before, so I'm gonna give you credit for it, impact sourcing which is try that there are companies out there that actually, for whom the social mission, say of sourcing uh, this jobs through jobs for this kind of population, or sourcing for diversity, or sourcing for some positive social mission, has become more important. So uh, it's interesting that you're saying es essentially, that's secondary to, and I guess it should be, to the quality of the, of the labor. You can make the social case, but the social case is an add-on. You get these highly uh, professional, committed, well-trained individuals to be part of a team, and in addition, you're, you're uh, addressing a social mission. And I think it makes it <laughs> sticky. I mean, to be honest, like all other things being equal, as long as you're sure that this vendor is going to give you quality results, why wouldn't you choose the vendor, which is also fighting poverty? Right. And what we find is that once people start getting embedded in these contracts with us, I mean, I've had so many stories of people who work in big tech companies who told me, literally, Lila, you know, I was about to quit. I was kind of demotivated. I wanted to do something more meaningful with my life than work at this venture back startup or this huge, you know, tech mm -hmm. company. And then we hired Somasource, and I started working directly with people who are moving out of poverty from you know, from places like Kenya and India and Haiti. And I feel like I have purpose again I'm when I come into work. Yes. And I, I can name names of people who <laughs> stayed two years longer at their product management jobs at big companies because they felt more motivated to come to work every day. Okay. And I think at some point we should quantify that and tell that to our customers. <laughs> no, I think more. that's really exciting <laughs> because we, we have, and I th your book cites, and, and, and probably people in this room know, there are lots of statistics indicating that certainly for millennials, that, that meaningfulness of their work as well as the technical challenges of their work, th those things determine the stickiness, whether they're loyal to the, to the company and to the job. So here you have an opportunity. Some of these, wor some of these uh, project workers in these tech companies may have, as you said, left, but as you, the combining of the mission with the work is very important, and particularly for millennials, particularly for the younger generation. So. I often use this statistic, but um, Cone Communications did a survey of millennials in the workforce and found that 80% of millennials uh, only want to work for a company that has a yeah. strong social mission. Yeah. And increasingly, thanks to technology, we're able to discern whose mission is full of fluff and who's actually delivering. And more and more we can show what the factory on the floor actually looks like. We can show the results of income surveys for the workers in that factory. It becomes harder and harder to, um, you know, to, to create a glossy CSR page that doesn't actually translate to what the company's doing. So, so we should, there's more and more work we can do on these metrics and mm -hmm. I agree with you. I think they're, they're very compelling. Um, 
before we move on to uh, to other questions, I, I want to talk a little bit about what I think is something called Sama School, which is related to Sama Source <laughs> and may be involved in doing similar activities in the U.S. And I think that given the conversations going on in the U.S. about the ability to create meaningful jobs for workers in, in various rural and far-flung and often poverty uh, places in the U.S., is Sama School involved in that, and how? Yes, I'm so glad you brought it up, and my team will laugh, but I own a lot of Sama domains. Um, presently, <laughs> <laughs> right. presently, we have just Source and School. <laughs> um, uh, so School started several years ago. It actually has a funny origin story. Okay. We had been running these ads on Hulu, the, um, the internet TV service, right. um, that highlighted our work in a refugee camp in Kenya. Um, called Dadaab. It's one of the poorest places in the world. And we'd run this pilot, which I thought was really inspiring, training these um, very destitute refugees to do work for big tech companies. And it was working. And we, we had this really cute like public service announcement that ran on this channel. And I got the nastiest email as soon as we started running these ads from this guy, Joe, in Ohio. Uh, Joe, oh, not Joe, Joe the plumber. Ohio. Was it Joe the plumber? <laughs> because he was he was e emailing everyone. I think at some point. That's right. That's right. Not Joe the plumber. Not Joe the um, plumber. Probably less charismatic. And Joe <laughs> Joe from Ohio wrote me this email that said the subject line was "You are ruining America," oh, and then it said, you know, oh people. Goodness. People like are you and your kind, your kind, um, are you know are ruining America. You're you're stealing our jobs and sending sending them to Africa, and it's the middle of a recession. And how dare you do this? Um, and I I read the email, and of course my first response was like I was so livid. At the time I was I literally I, you know Sama Source is a nonprofit. I was sleeping right. on my ex boyfriend's futon at right. one point. I was like so <laughs> poor myself, and I thought you know he probably thinks I'm some sort of like you know, millionaire sitting in my mansion in San Francisco, um, enjoying all the profits I'm raking in from sending <laughs> these jobs to refugee camps. And so I wrote this nasty email to him, and then I slept on it on the advice of Very a mentor. Good. Yeah, uh -huh. slept, and the next morning I deleted the email and I wrote this really nice email back and I said, Dear Joe, you know, I've looked at the unemployment statistics in Ohio. I get where you're coming from. Maybe there's some way we can adapt our model to also work here. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, Joe wrote back the nicest response. He said, mm -hmm. thank you so much for listening. I'm really sorry about the tone of my last email. I lost my job recently. And I just, you know, your ad just really made me upset because I want to do more to create jobs, you know, here in America. And I feel like we've, we're getting left behind. It was an interesting precursor to what's <laughs> recently been happening. Yes, absolutely. And so it inspired me to go to my board and say, maybe maybe we can do something here in the US. And, um, and I think it's important for international organizations to not be siloed. We have this really unfortunate distinction in the nonprofit world between people who work for foreign NGOs and people who work on domestic poverty. And it's tragic because it is the That's same right. issue. It's often the same bad guys. Yes, yeah, <laughs> so we same. need to work together more. So we. We tried a couple of different experiments working in the US. Um, we tried to adapt um, a more similar model to what we do overseas here, and it didn't work. It didn't work because companies have been outsourcing this work for a very long time already, already. to mm -hmm. places like India and China. And so trying to get that basic data services work to come back on shore, I think, is, is futile. Mm -hmm. And so we said, OK, well, what can we do that actually makes sense for America? And we, we looked at the gig economy. So it turns out that. All net employment growth, there's this Katz and Kruger study yes. uh, that came out. All net employment growth between 2005 and 2015 in the U.S. has been in the independent work arena. So that is, you know, um, contract work, basically, including all of these new gig economy platforms. And yet our workforce training in America has no instructions for workers on how to benefit on from this new on sector. How to connect, yeah, how to no. benefit, how to We're connect. We're teaching people to do jobs that have gone away 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so we said, well, what if, what if we focus on applying our learnings in the tech world to creating curriculum to teach people how to benefit from these new gig economy platforms, which sometimes get a bad rap. Mm -hmm. But look, the data speaks for itself. We're not going to shift the whole economy by boycotting one or two labor platforms. Instead, let's work with them and let's figure out how we can provide portable benefits, how we can ensure people are paid living wages, mm -hmm. and importantly, how we can prepare the most marginalized people in our society to actually benefit from these platforms. And so that's what Sama School does. We mm -hmm. have the first uh, gig economy training or independent okay. you know, worker uh, mm -hmm. training for low-income Americans. We've deployed it in San Francisco in the city. We just signed a contract with the Office of Education and Workforce 
workforce development. Oh, great. And so that training is now going out to people here. And we've seen amazing success stories. People going from $8 an hour, you know, minimum wage retail jobs where they have no flexibility, Mm -hmm. um, no online reputation. They're not getting any long-term benefit from doing these jobs to making $25 or $30 an hour on a platform like Field Nation or TaskRabbit where not only do they get this money, but they also get the benefit of having an online reputation. Mm -hmm. If you do a good job on your task, you get rated well. Yes, you get rated well, and Mm -hmm. then you get more clients, yeah. And that reputational equity is something that white collar workers are used to having yeah. through LinkedIn um, and through you know employer reference checks, but low income people are often denied that. And I'm really I think that's actually the future of job training in the, in this country. So it's really interesting that story. So right now, you're working with the city of San Francisco. I actually think that one of the interesting ways to imagine this happening is mayors and cities uh, actually really working to connect because you you have to have the you have to have the connecting organizations as well you you said in your uh, work in the developing economies you often work with nonprofits because you've got to find a way to connect to the communities of workers that you're serving okay and they help you do that Mm -hmm. Um, and I think uh, in in this case having uh, the mayor's office involved in this may actually uh, help bring more opportunities to the workers who are going through this. I think that's really an I even think model. we could do things like, um, first of all, I think there should be incentives for every city government to procure from social enterprises. So we could, yeah, <laughs> procurement is very big. I think, well, mm-hmm. let, let's talk a little bit about procurement because, so you, I think impact sourcing has a lot to do with procurement as I mm-hmm. understand it. So your number is exactly, so, so we have $12 trillion of procurement going on. And by, that's just the top And that's just companies. the top 2,000 companies. Uh, when I did this, I did a, a task last year for the for the UN on uh, ways to empower women around the world, and I said to all the governments in the room, you know, one thing you might do is just procure more from the women. That's not that hard a task, okay? You guys, in some developing countries, governments are like 30% of the economy in terms of procurement, in terms of goods that are bought and sold. So if you actually want to work with to bring jobs to the to, the, to those without jobs the two dollars or less a day workers or you want to bring jobs to uh, the women within that category you you can do that through procurement very 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 powerful <laughs> it's so simple I mean it's like we've heard that whole you know saying teach a man to fish and you you, don't, you right. feed him for a lifetime well okay first of all that should be a woman because women <laughs> invest 90 percent of their paychecks back in the family in, in the, the, the fishing poles they're they're actually and investing the fish, yes. in the, in the <laughs> equipment, right? <laughs> um, so, so there's that. But I, you know, I think it's so interesting that we forget that the best way to help someone isn't to give them a handout, which is which is fundamentally kind of a patronizing relationship. It's saying right. that look at me, I'm you know I'm superior and I can I can give you right. this poor person this money. But it's to engage with them on an, on a level playing field, which is which is to buy something from him or her. Mm-hmm. When you purchase something from someone, you're saying I value your contribution mm-hmm. and I'm willing to pay you my hard earned money um, for for what you're able to create. And I think it's a really empowering relationship, especially for low-income women who are so often, in so many ways, told that they're worthless. Right. So one of the things that I read uh, when you were talking about your journey, how you got to come up with this, was you, you were young, I think just high school, went, went to do some uh, special semester teaching English in a very poor uh, part of a very poor country in Africa. And the thing that struck you, and it's, it's triggered by what you just said, is people were really poor, but they were actually really talented. They were really hardworking. They were really people who, if you gave them an opportunity, they, they would make the most of it. So it was, there's the talent, but it's not being utilized. How can I possibly create utilization? So I, that's, I think, was a very important part of, of the personal story of how you got to this place. <laughs> yeah, well, um, so my father's here in the audience, and I, I owe a lot to my father's Jesuit education. Ah, he Jesuit the, um, education, yeah. all right. <laughs> he would recite things Not like, <laughs> <laughs> we'd be like, Dad, can we have more allowance? And he would be like, my children 
luxury is more ruthless than war. That was one of his favorite lines <laughs> from the <laughs> Roman poet. <laughs> um, so, so, so I wish I, could, I wish I could take all the credit for that philosophy, but we were educated about this stuff, and my dad used to subscribe to those, um, those beautiful new internationalist calendars mm -hmm. that have uh, photographs of people in developing countries and that give you statistics about poverty, and, and he would often remind us that we were you know, here by an accident of birth Mm -hmm. And that if it weren't for that, we, we might easily have been born in a slum in Kenya or in a rural part of, you know, India. And so, you know, we were always kind of told, look, you, you got lucky by being born here. It's not because you're some great gift to the universe that you're doing well in school, et cetera, because mm -hmm. a lot of people in your boat would probably do better than you. <laughs> and so... Um, thanks, Dad. Thanks, Dad. Yeah. <laughs> but it really stuck with me. And, um, and I got the chance. It was such a, an odd thing that happened. I, I got a scholarship. I was one of those, like, nerdy... Um, first generation Indian kids who applied for every scholarship in the guidance counselor's office. And um, <laughs> I knew that that was the only way I was going to be able to afford to go to school. So I got the scholarship from, of all places, a big tobacco company called Lorillard. If that is a big one. <laughs> it's a big one. I mean, I remember they sent a check, a $10,000 check in the mail to my house. Mm -hmm. And my mom opened it, and she's like, you have a $10,000 check from a tobacco <laughs> company. And it was this scholarship for community service I'd done in high school. And I, at the time, I really wanted to have an adventure and, and leave home, and I was um, kind of restless. Uh, and was it summer. broadly community service? So the community service, you could take it and go to yes. Africa? It was for That's work I'd done in high school, and it was, it was for a scholarship. And I convinced okay. the scholarship committee and my guidance counselor that it would be far more educational for me to graduate early and go off to I found this program in Ghana teaching English and I you know I'd love to say that this was like a saintly motivation but really it was motivated by just a desire to have an adventure okay. so I showed up in <laughs> Ghana thinking I would like help all of these poor African children learn English and of course my students who listened to Voice of America and BBC Radio and literally spoke like the Queen's English could, <laughs> they could name US senators oh, they could talk about like Bill Clinton's official state visit to Africa they were more knowledgeable about global affairs than most of my high school classmates, mm -hmm. yet they were all from $2 a day or under families, and it was a school for blind kids, so imagine, you know, oh, it's hard enough amazing. getting an education, um, you know, in, in West Africa, imagine, you know, doing that um, out of, you know, when you additionally have this disability. And what struck me most about this community is that, you know, I had grown up thinking, my brother and I really were were beneficiaries of the American dream. We, mm -hmm. we were born here, we both went to really great schools, we went to public school all our lives, we both had scholarships, we both did lots of odd jobs to make ends meet. And so I just sort of assumed that if you had the will and the skill to work that you could make it. Mm -hmm. And it never really dawned on me what life is like for the vast majority of extremely talented extremely. people who just happen to be born living in, in squalor. Right. And, and it really means a life of, of in my mind, you know, a lot of avoidable suffering that should not happen in 2017. Mm -hmm. We have all of the means in the world to fix this problem. It's, it's a matter of distribution, yes, really. Yes, you, you say that clearly, and I think that's right. I mean, it's a matter of distribution. It's a matter of controlling or affecting the distribution of resources and jobs, and I, I completely agree. Um, you told a, a human story about, about Joe. Before we go on, um, it would, I think, for this audience, Talk about a couple of the lives that you have affected in, in, in Africa. What, what has happened to these workers as you have found them and to their families? And, uh, and are these, I assume you're tracking whether the benefits uh, are sustainable, meaning that they continue over time. So, yeah. Well, um, I'll start at the macro level and talk about the data. Um, we have a member of our impact team here, but one of the things I, I learned, I worked at the World Bank and um, I used to work in the development research group, which is this like think tank that produces tank. reports that probably two people read. You might be one I of read them. them. I you read them, them. yes. Okay. I, I'm going to confess <laughs> here, I've read them. <laughs> and so you know, we turn out all this data, and, um, and one of the things I learned early on is that if you, you, know, you want to have a credible approach to fighting poverty, you have to have credible data around it. Right. And the more objective the data, the better. And so um, we're lucky enough to have all of these incredible resources. Muhammad Yunus, um, who actually just came out with a book as well, right. the founder of Grameen Indeed. Bank, um, the pioneer of microfinance, um, worked extensively with, with the World Bank to come out with a poverty index. It's really hard to measure poverty mm -hmm. levels mm -hmm. in places where they don't have a cash economy. Right? So you literally have to go around and measure assets in the house. Right. You have to look at whether someone has a roof, yes. what kind of roof it is, what kind of floor they might have to, to ascertain what poverty level the family mm -hmm. is living in. 
And so we do that at Somasource. We actually do baseline surveys of all of our workers to understand what income level they have at the point where they join us. We do six month surveys, you know, yearly surveys, and then we look at what happens to them long after they leave us. Remarkably, we see that they move on average from $2.20 a day to over $8 a day, and they stay at that they higher stay. income level even three years after they've left the program. Mm -hmm. So it is a permanent path out of poverty, and not just for those workers, but for all of the income dependents. Many of these workers are supporting five or six right, people in family. Family members, family members. And we see, we actually track what they spend their money on. Oh, you do? So, mm -hmm. And oh, so we publish okay. all this data in case you're curious. Um, oh, Tricia here will be happy. <laughs> samasource.org slash impact. And we even that's do fantastic. quarterly, um, they're sort of like the equivalent of quarterly investor calls. Um, we do quarterly learnings calls where we talk through these numbers and try to mm -hmm. you know, help people make sense of them. And lastly, I think importantly in this, in this space, um, there's a new trend around impact auditing and randomized control trials. Right. So really measuring in the same way that we would measure the efficacy of a new drug um, by doing a controlled experiment, we can now do that with poverty reduction programs, which is incredibly important. If you think about it, you're subjecting yes. people <laughs> to a program which may or may not work, and it's important to be responsible and be sure that your program works before you go and solicit grant funds to mm -hmm. deploy it. Mm -hmm. And so we're in, we just embarked on an, on an RCT and we did our first third-party impact audit which um, the results were published earlier this year and, and we did really well. Great, oh, that's fantastic. Yes, I mean RCTs, so these randomized, this is an effort to basically really look at effectiveness by, you, it takes some time because you're basically comparing your intervention with a non-intervention and trying to see the extent mm -hmm. to which it really affects things. And Boy, there are so many. Go ahead. Oh, well, I was going to share a story. So yeah, I, yes, please, yes. I did the political yes. thing where I didn't answer yeah, no, your no, question no, you, at that's all. That's right, you started <laughs> macro. Well, you were appealing to me, the economist. So the macro right. stuff really is great, but now a couple of human stories. <laughs> trying to be a good student here. Um, so uh, so I, I share this story a lot because it's it's just like kind of, stranger than fiction. I met this young man named Ken Kihara in Mathari slum in Nairobi. And Mathari is one of those places that looks like a post-apocalyptic movie setting. How many of you have seen Elysium, the movie Elysium? Anybody saw it? Okay. It's this movie about like what happens when, mm -hmm. you know, 500 years from now or something, the earth has devolved into a massive slum and all the rich people have moved to a space island. It's kind of underway right now, but <laughs> that's another, that's another subject. Um, but the saddest thing about this movie, actually, incidentally, is that um, both the slum scenes and the rich people scenes were both filmed in modern-day Mexico City. Oh, so wow. uh -huh. right. think about that. So, but Mathari really looks like a scene out of one of these movies. Um, it is a place where you see open sewers and beautiful, you know, young children playing outside open sewers. People are dying of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis all over the place. People are dying of cholera outbreaks. I mean, it's a setting that, you know, shouldn't belong in the modern yeah. world. Mm -hmm. And in this slum, um, there are under, I think between like 800K and a million people living. And one of them used to be this guy, Ken Kihara. And I met him at, outside of his home in the slum just after he'd started working for Samasource. And uh, he introduced me to his home. There was an open sewer right outside. His beautiful daughter was playing right next to the sewer. He was living in a mud-walled hut with a tin roof, just one tiny room in which he tried to cook. He'd bring, like, kerosene to cook, which is, by the way, a major problem. It gives kids right. asthma and all sorts of other <laughs> problems. Mm -hmm. um, he told me that regularly his home would be broken into and all of his belongings would be stolen. Um, he showed me the bathroom he went to and told me that he was afraid to go to the bathroom often at night because he could get mugged or That's attacked. Very dangerous. It was very dangerous. And then Ken told me the mm -hmm. most crazy thing. So this man, if you met him and he was wearing a business suit here in San Francisco, you would never guess his background. He <laughs> speaks beautiful English. English. She's extremely charismatic, showed up early for our meeting, you know, just a professional presence. You would never imagine that he came from this background. And so it turned out that Ken had gotten admitted to one of the best boarding schools in Nairobi on a full scholarship and had graduated from that boarding school. By the way, before he got selected, uh, he had been orphaned. He'd been an orphan. His mother and seven of her nine siblings had died of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. Oh. You could not make this up, right? I mean, so here you meet this guy who's like managed against every odd that the universe could throw at you, 
to graduate from one of the best schools in Nairobi. And so you would think, okay, great, now he's going to get a job and he's going to change the trajectory of his family. Except that in Nairobi, there's 70% youth unemployment. There's no, yeah, no, no job. jobs. No jobs. Especially no not jobs. for a, a kid from a slum. Mm -hmm. And so he finishes this high school and he goes back to the slum after we've made this huge investment in his education. And so often as, as donors, we think, okay, education is the answer, but if there are no jobs after the mm -hmm. you know, education, then what's the point? It's almost in, in some ways worse because people are aware of what they're missing. Mm -hmm. So Ken moves back to the slum. The only job he could get was selling this local moonshine called Chang'a. He actually told me to where, uh, took me to where they brew it. <laughs> and it's these guys, I met another guy who was brewing this moonshine, mm -hmm. who had a, uh, a degree in IT from a Western Kenyan <sighs> university and who was forced to live in the slum because again, there's no jobs. Yeah. So here are these talented young people who have so much to offer, who are so motivated, literally dredging up like sewer water to brew this horrific moonshine. They mix it with kerosene. Ken told me that people in the slum drink it to forget themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like sniffing glue. Yeah. So these guys are selling this stuff by the side of the road. Meanwhile, you know, our typical idea of someone who's selling this kind of stuff is that there's no way that they could have a real job, right? We never would imagine that someone who's selling moonshine by the side of the road in a slum in the middle of Nairobi is someone who could be capable of doing work for Google, mm -hmm. right? And yet, that's exactly what that's happened. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> Ken, what happened. Ken gets into one of our feeder uh, programs. Uh, it's a computer training program in the slum. Quickly does well, gets hired to do data entry, does well at that, gets promoted and promoted. Finally, I'll just fast forward. Um, last year in December, I went to Beirut because we had just launched a training program with the World Food Program uh, to train Syrian refugees in digital work skills. Mm -hmm. And Ken had taken his first flight out of the country to be the leader of this project. So now Ken has trained over 500 people in digital work skills from Mathare all the way to mm -hmm. Lebanon. He didn't like the food though, he told me. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, and he moved out of the slum. He has his daughter in an amazing school. I mean, he literally looks like a different person. Mm -hmm. And that is what's possible when we give work. When you give work, when you find a way to take this talent and, f and give work and using all of the the, the wonderful technology and the wonderful employers that you can use uh, the technology to link to. So so we're going to run out of time, and I, and I want to get to a couple of other areas. I think we all would uh, really benefit from understanding a bit more about your own business model. So it's a nonprofit. It's doing lots of things. Uh, some a school, some a source. You just talked about opening a new training thing in Beirut. You have a very, you're doing RCTs. You have impact assessment. So you have a budget. Uh, how do you finance the operation? And why is it a nonprofit. I mean, what, you know, you you could have made it a B Corp. You could have made it mm -hmm. a for profit. You've so tell me a little bit about the financial model and sure. and then related to that, uh, it's sustainability. Do you think it's on a court? You worry about the financial model going forward. Do you need to tweak it in some way? Mm -hmm. So um, I'll start by saying that we have a problem in the U.S., which is I, I think we're, we're still very unevolved when it comes to business models. We have, on the one hand, profit-maximizing corporations, and then on the other hand, uh, charities. Mm -hmm. And what we think about when we think about these two models is, you know, make all the money we can doing whatever we need to do, including polluting the stream mm -hmm. and employing slaves and literally things that companies, big companies still do. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe we'll donate money at the end of the day um, over here to this charity model where you have these nonprofits which are really ill-equipped to handle these big problems and subsist entirely on grants and donations. And that's the traditional idea we have of mm -hmm. business and charity. But really all of the most interesting social and environmental impact work is happening in the middle mm -hmm. in this new space of social business. Okay. And B corporations live in that space. A lot of earned revenue nonprofits live in that space. Earned revenue um, Nonprofits. Mm -hmm. um, nonprofits that are getting a stream of revenue from mm -hmm. business operations that support the mission. There are so many amazing ones. We have Delancey Street here in the city. We have Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles, uh, Old School Cafe in the Bayview. So, so is that what you are? I mean, would you say you're an, you're an owned revenue, uh, earned yeah. revenue, and earned therefore revenue. Earned, revenue, earned revenue going back into sustaining and building yeah. this operation? So what we've done is we actually separate the P&L of each of our programs so that donors know that they're not subsidizing a 
contract for Microsoft or Google, that you know, donor revenue is going towards training and towards our programs that are R&D and supporting mm -hmm. really very clear social mission objectives. Our business, uh, Samasource, is actually now profitable off of our earned revenue. So all of the operations around that business are entirely covered by the revenue we earn from those contracts. And we just hit that milestone last year after eight years of operations. So, so in thank you. <laughs> So in this blend of uh, sort of taking some grant money, maybe some philanthropic money from donors, and then earning revenue, what's the, what's the sort of breakdown over all of the whole summer source? Yeah. Um, well, we have um, about a $16 million budget, $15, mm -hmm. $16 million, and um, the majority of that is in our source program. It's mm -hmm. the earned revenue business. It's the earned revenue business. Yep, and a, and a small percentage of that, it's it's under a million right now is our Sama School program. I hope that grows. We're trying to now work with city governments around the country to get them to sign on. So to they would sign uh, on and basically buy, uh, support the training that exactly. they would give to or buy a license. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we're actually thinking about different business models. So we actually just took our first equity investment. So we, as a nonprofit, we own a subsidiary. Our, our work center is in the countries that we operate in. For example, in Kenya, that work center is a is a for-profit business that we basically wholly owned as a nonprofit, oh, okay. and we just sold some equity in that business to a European impact investor, actually a foundation that's oh, okay. looking to make impact investments. Okay. So there's all these new, really interesting new ways hybrid of, yeah, models. Hybrid. And what I think is exciting is it used to be that foundations used to have, um, the people that ran the finances for the foundations were entirely divorced from the mission people. Yes. So you'd have foundations literally investing in like tobacco companies and right. you know all these things that are like creating the very problem that then the nonprofit side of the foundation is trying to solve. It makes no sense. So really what we need to see is convergence, right? We need to see that the investments we're making are in businesses that not only avoid doing bad, but actually proactively do good. Yeah. And um, I have a great example of this. I just got off the phone yesterday with a person from Conservation International, mm -hmm. one of the leading conservation organizations. They're now investing in companies that um, build sustainable business models around protecting wild assets. Mm -hmm. So, for mm -hmm. example, uh, companies like Runa, the tea company that's sourcing, a, um, I think, from the Amazon and Ecuador, a rare ingredient. Or there's all these new models that show local people that they can make more money preserving the tree that creates a, a potentially profitable ingredient than by cutting it down and selling that land to a cattle farmer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let me ask a question then of a little bit about your other company because the other company you founded Lexme is a for profit. So why why did you choose that model and do you ha are there any links between them are they totally separate uh, yeah. entrepreneurial ventures? Okay, so as you can tell, I have a bit of a sickness for starting things. <laughs> and so when I had the idea for Luxme, I first went to my board of Samasource and I was like, okay, I know you're going to think this is crazy, but I have this new idea. And, um, and I had come across this really amazing ingredient in northern Uganda. It's a rare type of shea so butter. So related to this ingredient, I, that's, that's what triggered my question, was thinking about what you just said about yes. you have a real asset that you can protect and actually monetize. Yes. So I'm like, I'm, I love going to local markets when I travel and I love kind of finding out what local people are using and I came across this ingredient called nilotica. It's like an heirloom variety of shea butter and all the women in northern Uganda have beautiful skin and it's it's said that they have that because they use this product. So of course I wanted to get my hands on some and I go and get it. Then I find out that this, um, this nut only grows wild on trees that take 20 years to mature mm -hmm. and those trees only grow in northern Uganda, South Sudan and parts of Ethiopia. So I'm thinking what an amazing story how come no one has marketed this as like a luxury item before? And I go back and I remember flying back through duty free and looking at like the high end Chanel skin creams. Um, and I, <laughs> you know, I love like yes. my, 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 one of the women in my life early on always told me like, even if you're really broke, always invest in your, your face. You only have one face. So <laughs> buy the expensive skin cream. And you, and you go through those duty free things and they've got everything out there. So you're basically, and, and usually you're, 
one is looking pretty wretched because you just get off. Yeah. So you're like an easy target, right? Such an easy target. <laughs> and so I'm like coming off this like flight from Uganda. I always, we always fly through uh, through Amsterdam and I'm like get duty free. And I'm looking at this skin cream wondering if I should buy it. And I just looked at the ingredient label just to see, you know, mm. what's in here. And, um, you know, it's things like red number five, yellow number seven, dimethicone, <laughs> all kinds of horrifically toxic ingredients. And if you start doing more research, you realize that many of these things are known carcinogens that are allowed in $200 an ounce jars of skin cream. So we're shelling out our money, which by the way, is not going to women owned no. enterprises no. or enterprises no. that support women in the supply chain. It's literally going to the man. And for products that, that don't even, you know, not only do they not do good things for us, but they don't do anything for the world. For and the world, so, for the environment, for jobs. Yeah. For and so I thought, you know, maybe this is a really interesting opportunity. What if we could build a Sama Source-like <laughs> model in the luxury space? Okay, okay. In luxury, you typically have enormous gross margins. Um, often it's women who are doing the purchasing. Very few of these products actually benefit women, either in the supply chain or as owners. Mm -hmm. And yet women are doing all of the spending. And I thought, well, why not build a Sama source like brand in this category? And so I came back, I talked to my board about it, and they were like, okay, fine, do it. Just raise extra money not for here. it. Not here. <laughs> do it on the side. And so I decided to donate a third of my personal um, shares in Luxme to the nonprofit, to Sama Source. Okay. If we ever have an okay. exit, Sama Source will do well. And we also set it up. We're going through the B Corporation registration process. So Luxme is a, will be a B It's a for profit. Oh, okay. And the idea is at the time I started Sama Source, I was pretty agnostic as to the structure. I just wanted to build a company whose primary mission would be to move people out of poverty. Mm -hmm. The um, the way we structured it was kind of incidental. And at the time, B Corps were just getting formed. I actually they, called yeah, the they, founders right. of it. They, yeah. Just and so I think now this is really the most rich and exciting space is this in-between what Muhammad Yunus calls uh, social business, non-loss and non-dividend companies. And he argues that when you are freed from the profit motive of your investors, but at the same time constrained by having to be sustainable as a business, right, you have so non-loss. You need a revenue way to exactly. continue. Exactly. Um, that's where a lot of really powerful innovation can happen in fields. I think, you know, imagine if we had social enterprise prisons in this country instead of the horrific yeah. for-profit yeah. prisons we have. Imagine if we ran so many, you know, I think it's it's um I think it's easy to criticize government run programs often they're bureaucratic and inefficient but social enterprises eliminate that bureaucracy and at the same time don't have I think the pressure to deliver profits which can be at odds with Well as you said the governments can procure from such companies so actually the For ideal sure. thing some some of these things may actually end up being sensibly a government mission it may be a government mission of a mayor to basically have some retraining programs to try to get workers skilled and out of the un that's a, that's a public mission with a and there may be some public mm -hmm. dollars, but they can't really necessarily do it well, so that's why they can then turn to a Sama source uh, or a Sama school mm -hmm. to try to help them. Uh, so I think c combining procurement or public policy dollars with these kinds of institutions is very powerful. So we're going to uh, have open up to questions in five minutes. So I have like tons of questions to still ask. I think I'm going to end with, uh, a we talked about Licks me, and in that process, we, we talked about women. So it is the case that there have been a lot of stories lately, hor horrifying stories, really, about what's happened to women in the tech community. Okay, they're they're really now they are uh, first world problems. Okay, they're not, um, and I know one of your comments, and I agree with it, is you know we we have to worry about thinking about feminism as a first world issue. It's a global issue. And some of the problems for women, many of the problems for women are much more extreme when you also combine heavy, heavy disadvantage. And uh, so, but the point is, uh, in your own personal story, where you've been amazingly successful, you have really good links with the tech community, you're an entrepreneur, you're raising uh, projects from companies like Google, have you encountered, what, have there been any special challenges associated with this, things you've had to, to deal with? Are there role models who've helped you? Are there, uh, are, are there mentors who've helped you? I mean, how have you, have you managed in what sounds like a pretty hostile climate yeah. uh, to have this success? It can be, and I actually find um, the form of, um, of sexism that I, that I find most problematic is actually, um, 
is paternalism. Paternalism. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't tell you how many times people have said, oh, that is like, that's so sweet. Is that your full-time job? Somebody asked me that about Samosaurus once, and I was like, <laughs> are you kidding? And, you know, or like, oh, I, you know, at a conference where I was like speaking as one right. of the featured speakers, who are you here with? You know, assuming that I was somebody's like right. wife or girlfriend. Right. And so right. it's that sort of thing that like constantly undermines your, mm -hmm. your sense of confidence, especially when you get that right before you go on stage. Right before you go um, on stage. <laughs> And so, um, but that's the least of it. I think ultimately, you know, the problem that women in developing countries are facing is very similar to actually the problem that women in tech face, which is that um, we don't control the financial resources. That is the biggest issue. Okay. You know, if you want to solve the problem, look at where the money is going and who it's coming from. Mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. and I think that's, that's really, it's at a different scale, but it's the same issue everywhere. When I think about role models, um, one of the people that inspired me to do this work is a, is a woman, was a woman named Priya Haji. Mm -hmm. who uh, started an amazing organization called World of Good. She was the first of her kind. She realized when she would travel to developing countries and see women who made these beautiful artisanal products like bracelets and rugs and pillows, you know, that you might see at like Nordstrom selling for $200. Well, the women who make them make like 10 cents of that, that, right? And she realized, well, what if I created a retail brand and bought these products wholesale from these women, paid them living wages, and then retailed them as a, you know, as a fair trade kind of model. So she built the first fair trade brand for artisanal goods. Mm -hmm. And she sold at Whole Foods and the Stanford Bookstore. And, and if you ever knew Priya, she was just a force of nature. You yeah. could not say no to this woman. <laughs> so I saw her speak at a nonprofit conference in 2007. And she gave this amazing talk about starting her company, which at the time maybe had 40 employees. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I decided that day that I would eventually quit my job and do this full time. And uh, her company then became profitable. She sold World of Good to eBay, and okay. they became the first online fair trade retailer of mm -hmm. artisanal goods. Very pioneering. Right. And then the other thing about Priya that was amazing is that as a woman, as a single woman, she decided she was going to have a family. And she went about it in an amazing way. She right. went and had two kids on her own. And I had dinner with her a month before she tragically passed away. Mm -hmm. And she told me, you know, Lila, um, we're so often told as women that we need to have this like perfect partner and we need to have a family that looks a certain way and that should be plan A and everything else is plan B. Well, she said, screw that. This is my plan A. Plan A is the life I'm living now. I've had an amazing, fulfilling career in doing work that benefits other people. And to me, that's more important than having like a picture perfect, you know, white picket fence mm -hmm. existence in the suburbs. And, um, and I sat there looking at her and looking at her beautiful kids and what she'd built. And I thought, yeah, that's the way to do it. <laughs> and um, luckily, she has a strong family. When she passed away, her kids went to her brother. But she inspired so many so of many, us so many. in our space. And she had the doggedness of like the most, you know, I don't know, of like a Mark Zuckerberg or an Elon Musk. But that applying that same sort of passion and, and strength to the world of social enterprise, which desperately needs more leaders like that. Well, I think you, re you remind me a lot of Priya. Uh, so uh, both, both uh, Priya and Lila were... Uh, went through what's called the Global Social Venture Competition at UC Berkeley at the Haas School, which is, I was once dean there, and I would say among the accomplishments of my being dean, one of the things I'm most proud of is starting this up. We've built it out. We have all new partners. By the way, I have a new partner in Beirut, so. <laughs> um, and uh, what's interesting about that story, of course, is that oftentimes one thinks of mentors or role models as someone who's like, you know, generationally different. In, in this case, Priya has been a role model, inspirational model for people of her generation. And, and it's just a, a, a lovely story. Um, I will just end with, you know, one of the things that uh, did come up over and over again in the wor work we did for the UN on how to empower women was the importance of models that you, you could sort of see a pathway. You could see, okay, I can do this. And that plus also, and this goes to your paternalism, the, the, the expectations people carry around about women. So you're in a room and they're going to be paternalistic because they expect that certain things must be true of you just because you're a woman. And they're not, they're not true. So anyway, uh, fascinating, fascinating story. Uh, I have to give up my right of answering <laughs> questions now <laughs> to give it to the audience. So we, need, we already have some questions lined up right there. Just a, as a reminder, if you have a question, please make your way up to the mic. And we have our first question here. Hi, <coughs> you've got my heart. 
Um, <laughs> are you coordinating with other like-minded organizations like Kiva and Finca International and um, the Peace Corps that has been do doing a lot of small enterprise development mm. for development success in, for 50 years. Yes, I'm so glad you asked that, and yes, um, we have coordinated with a lot of them. Um, I had uh, Johnny Price from Kiva Zip on, a, we did a Facebook Live together in the office recently, and Premel, um, who uh, is now leading Kiva, uh, is, has been a mentor of ours for many years. And what we try to do with these partners is basically um, help them implement similar kind of impact sourcing programs. We have a group that we just launched called Advisory Services, where we consult to other nonprofits and help them build sustainable business models around digital work. And we're also piloting a really cool program. It's like a Again, I'm going to be accused of, <laughs> of, um, of being too broad. Um, but we, we piloted this model where we teach people how to be digital freelancers on sites like Upwork. Upwork right, is sort Upwork. of like eBay for mm -hmm. services. It's mm -hmm. a huge marketplace where you can sell your services as a translator or a proofreader or an administrative assistant. Amazing opportunity for someone who happens to live in a poor place but has the skills to do this kind of work. So um, we just piloted a version of this in Nairobi where we've created a co-working space where people can come, they can get this training, and then they start paying once they've done the training and start earning money on Upwork, paying to use the space. Oh, okay. And that can, if you think about it, at a unit level be profitable. Mm -hmm. So you can have an entrepreneur who's running a small like community co-working center, and as long as the people are earning money by going to the center, then they can afford to pay to use the mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. And this model, I think, could be very powerful in migrant communities. It could be very powerful in many parts of the world where we don't have the bandwidth personally to operate. And so we just met with Pro Mujer last week, actually, another big um, women's microfinance organization to see if we can do something like that with them. Oh, sure. <laughs> Great. Hi. Uh, poverty researchers generally will divide the poor into the hardcore poor and the transitional poor. Uh, the hardcore poor are, I think, the population you don't deal with, the drug addicts, the mentally ill, the intergenerational poor, and then you know, you have the population that I think you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. So that means government is left. The very inefficient government is left with the hardcore poor. Is there any, do you have any thoughts on, uh, because nobody talks about how inefficient government, I worked for CMS, trillion dollar agency, blows $100 billion a year, probably doesn't come close to anywhere. What is happening with the public sector? Can you talk about anything that's being done? Mm -hmm. Because they're the ones that are dealing with the really deep poor. Yeah, I'm so glad you bring that point up. Um, we, I talk about this in the book, but we had been working for many years in a really poor community in Arkansas called Dumas. It's in the Mississippi River Delta, and the population there is what you would call hardcore poor. Um, intergenerational you know, poverty and, and generational trauma, which by the way never gets talked about. If your ancestors went through Jim Crow and you saw horrific things happening you know, relatively recently, it's hard to imagine that this community can just bounce back from that. And so in this area, I mean, it was a fight to get anything done. We couldn't get high-speed internet to this community. I mean, I have better internet in our center in Nairobi than I do in wow. America, in Arkansas. We had very big challenges with literacy rates. People would come in speaking far worse English far than worse. our workers in Nairobi. Um, and it was just like layer upon layer of struggle. And finally, we realized we don't have the budget to be able to sustain this program responsibly. And in order to make it work in this community, we would need a massive investment in infrastructure, in educational opportunity, in a range of different things. And part of the problem in some of these rural, far-flung communities in the US is that there's no money to sustain them. If you, if you live in poverty in New York City, um, Yes, it sucks, but there are tons of agencies and there's other resources and there's a lot of wealth around you that's creating institutions that can lift you up. No one is investing in Dumas, Arkansas. And so it was a really tragic decision we had to make to shut that program down and then try to transition the program to local agencies. I would say our learning from that is um, maybe a few things. One is that I think we have a tremendous infrastructure problem in this country and we don't admit that enough. Mm -hmm. We can't be a you know, a developed nation and competitive with other countries that are investing massively in like, you know, STEM education. We don't even have internet in many parts of the country <laughs> because of the way we've decided, I think, to distribute access. Um, a second piece of this is I really think 
procuring through social enterprise, believe it or not. I think if there were mandates that at least governments, but ideally even corporations, could get tax breaks for hiring marginalized people, we might see a change. Imagine if, you know, for every formerly incarcerated person you hired, which, by the way, is a person who's not going back to prison, therefore saving me, the taxpayer, the 200 grand a year that it costs to keep someone in prison, there should be a tax benefit for that company that's doing that. I think we should be incentivizing hiring and creating jobs among these people. So many of the incentives that I see to bring a company into a new city have, have no requirements that that company actually hire low-income people from that city, mm -hmm. which to me is ridiculous. If my taxpayer dollars are going to subsidize a company moving into my city, they should have obligations around actually hiring people, ideally people who come from low-income backgrounds so that my tax dollars aren't being used to you know, pay uh, for various government services they might benefit from. I think this is starting to happen. Mm -hmm. There are programs like wage subsidies in some more progressive cities, but it's mm -hmm. certainly happening at you know one fraction of 1% of the scale that it could be. So those are some ideas, and I, I won't presume to know them all, but I, I think we can, we can move the needle with social enterprise. I think, I think there's a fair amount of, there's a lot of uh, bipartisan thinking and support in the incarceration area, in this issue of, of what are the programs that actually work to get that population as it comes out uh, back into, the, into society and the workforce rather than recidivism. So I, that, that's an area where I actually am, optimistic that state and local and maybe even federal dollars uh, can will be employed uh, mm -hmm. because there's a, just a recognition that it's tremendously wasteful. I mean, it's the only people who are benefiting are private prison companies. Yeah, our, com our, our, the, our prisons, yeah, our prisons themselves, <laughs> private and public, actually. Hi, Lila. My name is Geronimo, and thank you so much for speaking tonight. Uh, I'd like to know more uh, about what work Salmasource is doing with refugees and how they're planning to adapt their model to fit a refugee worker. And when I say refugee worker, I mean when workers are constantly on the move country to country and have very unstable home lives. Such a great question. Um, so we started working with refugees back in 2009 um, when I got that email. Um, and we started working in Dadaab through a partnership with CARE. CARE um, is a large humanitarian agency. I used to be on their board, actually, and they serve a lot of refugee camps. They manage all of the... Um, all of the infrastructure there. The biggest challenge we faced is that technically it's illegal to hire refugees in many countries mm -hmm. because they're seen as competing with locals for jobs. So that's the first obstacle. You have this huge population of people that's sitting there in a camp that's unable to leave the camp and also unable to work and solely dependent on food rations and other forms of aid, which is basically a recipe for disaster. Dadaab became a big recruiting ground for al-Shabaab terrorists, and it's no surprise because there's literally, people are sitting there living in squalor with nothing to do, no economic opportunity. Um, I think um, a few things could happen. A lot of people are urging um, reform for refugee work rights um, and saying that it is a, you have a right to work, and um, there are all kinds of, of like temporary work programs that are now being piloted that are, I think, really exciting. I think the second thing is equipping refugees with skills that are portable. And one of the beautiful things about digital work is that these are skills you can take with you and apply wherever you happen to be. Mm -hmm. And so we've, um, we've tried to implement our SAMA school. We have an online version, a training program uh, in different refugee communities. And I think that model of getting people to find work on platforms like Upwork is very promising. Um, that sector is exploding. And many people that we find in refugee communities are actually fairly well educated and left behind good jobs at home, so they're more than capable of doing this, sorts of, this sort of work. Are some of the refugee organizations, uh, say uh, International Rescue Committee or some of the big ones, are they provide, because you've got to get, to do that digital work, you have to have the equipment, you have yeah. to have the broadband, you have yeah. to have the environment for, so is that, are you working in partnership with with the yes. those organizations. So one of the things that broke my heart was I, I first went to Dadaab because I'd read this report that said that the Norwegian Refugee Council had built these computer labs in Dadaab and that young people who'd finished high school, there's one one-room high school in this camp that is the most depressing thing you've ever seen, but people had actually lived their entire lives in this camp and graduated from high school in that one room wow. high school and then started taking online university courses in this computer lab that had been set up there. 
with satellite at the time, internet. And so I, when I read that report, I said, that's where we have to do our Sama source training, and that's where we eventually ended up um, doing our training. So there is internet infrastructure in some of these places. I think the biggest obstacle, honestly, is the red tape around regulating whether refugees can, can have work. jobs. Can that's, work. that's the biggest problem. Yeah. So we have time for three more questions. Sorry. So <laughs> I don't know if they're uh, just to <laughs> go in order, and then we'll have to keep the next for, uh, for the reception. So. Good evening, Lila. I have three questions, but I'm going to try to merge them together. So I'll Please. Uh, so <laughs> my question is, how does someone from outside of the community come in and find these individuals who obviously have skills? How do you train them, and is it like something you can do on a larger scale basis because training for new jobs is really essential? And three is, uh, how do you actually get these products that have quality ingredients to be what women want to buy as opposed to Chanel, which everyone wants to buy even though it's bad for yeah. them? And doesn't really improve. I still haven't cracked that nut, but I'll let you know when I do. Um, <laughs> uh, we um, okay. I'll start with the quality piece. So we um, we actually have a lab in um, in New Jersey that's like certified. They have all the certifications, are organic, and so we send raw materials to them, and they help us formulate. One thing that I've learned as a social entrepreneur is again the social mission will not sell the product. Right. The efficacy and the unique selling proposition will sell the product, and the social mission can be a nice add-on. Yeah. So the product has to work. We did like clinical testing. I actually sell the product on QVC, which is very surreal. Um, <laughs> and, um, and we show like before and after photos and, you know, it looks a lot like a typical product, but then I'm like, by the way, this is also made by low-income women in Uganda and you're supporting fair wage practices. Um, so that's on that side. And on the Samasaur side, um, you know, the best thing to do working in these communities is to talk to locals and to find out the organizations that are already successful in recruiting low-income people. Mm -hmm. And what we did is we said, hey, we know you guys already work in the slums. You're doing all kinds of different empowerment training, but your problem is you don't have a way to connect people that go through your programs to work. So we come in and we say, we can be that provider of, of work if, if we can have some influence over the type of computer training you're doing and we give them our curriculum. So we've done that with an NGO in Kibera slum called the Human Needs Project, uh, where Ken now works. And they had this beautiful training facility and they were really hungry for curriculum that would actually lead to a job at the end. And so, so often there's already an ecosystem that you can plug into without reinventing the wheel. So that's really important because I, I, uh, you didn't mention in that question, but the, the term scalability also always comes up. Mm -hmm. So the curriculum is something that can be scaled. I mean, if you find the right partners all over the place. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's really. We have 50,000 people who've enrolled in Sama schools online curriculum from India and the Philippines, and I think it's like 65 countries. Um, and anyone can use that curriculum. I got a report from a friend's father, actually, <laughs> who uh, works in development in Ethiopia, who used the curriculum to kind of hack together a digital training course for Somali refugee women. Mm -hmm. So now he's training them and he's setting them up in, the, in a co-working space to go and do work on Upwork. And that curriculum is available for free. So I encourage you all, <laughs> if you want to go and start a computer <laughs> training program in Ethiopia with our curriculum, please do. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. So as more and more jobs are taken by machinery and new technology that we create, what do you, th or do you think that our, I guess, world economy will be able to create new jobs to replace all the ones that are being lost? And also, what do you think that the government can do to help businesses that are creating jobs in this area? That is the trillion dollar question. And I will say that labor economists, economists in general are quite divided on AI, they are. On AI. I spend some time with these economists, um, Eric Brynolfsson and Andrew McAfee, who are a little bit, you know, pessimistic about it. Um, a and little bit. They've, <laughs> yes. they've adjusted since they've then, They've adjusted right? a little bit. Um, adjusted. It's really hard, you know, speaking with, with an economist, because I can't just, like, throw out my random ideas as facts. <laughs> 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 so, um, You're f I fact-checked everything. It's all okay, good. way above the board. It's all um, <laughs> So, um, so I think the jury's out. So I, I talked to a lot of people in machine learning at our client companies. Like I talked to a very senior executive at Facebook um, who works on uh, Facebook Messenger, and I was talking to him about the Facebook Messenger chat bots, which are emerging. And I was like, you know, are these just going to take over all the customer service jobs? And he said, it's, Lila, it's going to be a very long time. We need to create so much training data. You have no idea. There's going to be lots of jobs in creating that training data. 
So really, I think the future is in figuring out um, how your role will eventually interact with a computer um, and how you can make the most of that hybrid, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think what we're going to see is just like what we've seen with Somasource. When I started out doing this work, we were doing data entry. We were literally doing things like converting PDF files into text files. Now that can entirely be done by software at a very high accuracy level, and that's just happened in the last seven years, right? So as we've um, as we've grown the business, we've evolved what kind of services we offer in tandem with how technology is evolving. The best estimate I've heard is like Ray Kurzweil, who says that um, the singularity, so the moment at which computer intelligence will eclipse human intelligence, will happen in like 2044. Maybe he's adjusted 2044. it. 2044. 2044. <laughs> so just put that date in your calendar. Midna midnight on Midnight, <laughs> yeah. At that point, all bets are off. But at least until then, I think there's still going to be quite a need for humans. Um, and I, I think the other thing that we should be aware of is that we choose the economic systems that we live in. These are not natural right. laws. This is not physics. We decide how we want to structure our economic systems. And there was a time in this country during the Works Progress Administration when we decided that we were going to massively invest in job creation to do all sorts of things. Um, mm -hmm. We had people, I remember discovering this in the Library of Congress, we had people who were paid by the government to go out and record oral histories in the South. There are entire archives in the Library of Congress of beautiful spirituals that are sung in black churches in the South that somebody got paid to go and record mm -hmm. by the government because we thought it was important to preserve the cultural legacy of the South. These are the types of things we could choose to be investing in. We could choose to fund neighborhood child care centers. We could choose to fund, you know, farmer's markets. <laughs> there are so many things we could choose to fund with the surplus that machines can theoretically create. If we don't have to do all of this, you know, manual labor or even knowledge work and machines can do it for us, um, you know, Bill Gates has proposed a robot tax. I think that's a brilliant idea. Mm -hmm. We can tax the gains that are made by these algorithms and invest that in creating jobs in areas that were not traditionally valued by the economic system, often in things that women do to be honest. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. so I'm optimistic. Okay. I just think it's going to take the will to, to reform our economic systems accordingly. I think those of us who worry about it think that all, well, everything you say is absolutely true, but I sometimes get involved with technologists who they're saying how fast the technology is moving, and I'm thinking how slow society moves to redesign <laughs> its institutions and policies and social contract. And, you know, so we're like falling behind yeah. in addressing new organizational structures, new incentive structures, everything. Absolutely. The technology is whipping forward. <laughs> so, all right, one more question. Um, I feel like I have the uh, unpopular question. I hope it's not taken the wrong way. Um, I'm, you know, I'm just wondering how do you help the participants um, turn their initial training and their first jobs into sustainable and meaningful careers, you know, how, how do you make sure they're not taken advantage by the wrong people, you know, people mm -hmm. who are trying to, like, commit, like, fraud or, you know, scam. They're still, they're also looking for, like, cheap labor who have these yeah. skills. So, yeah, it's a very, it's a very important and good question, to, uh, good ending question. And when you're answering that, Lila, you many times use in your work and in your statements the notion of a, a living wage. So this is a, how, that's related to this because you're, you're basically training people, but you want them end to end up with a living wage. So yeah. how do you? So, um, so that's a really good it's question. It's a really good question. Um, two pieces. Uh, so one is um, we have to make sure that we're paying living wages and that we even know what, how to calculate a living calculate wage that. and that we're not coming up with that ourselves because that would be you know, a little biased. Um, luckily, Priya Haji, pioneered a model she called did. the Fair Wage Guide, which is still in existence. She you can did. look it up at Fair Wage Guide. Um, and she brought together a group of academics mm -hmm. at Berkeley and around the country, I think, to um, understand the cost of living in urban mm -hmm. and rural areas in every country in the world and to publish a neutral guide for people who are sourcing from developing countries to understand what a living wage should be in that region. So we use that as the floor at the very lowest, we have to pay living wages to our workers immediately upon uh, joining Samasource. Um, in addition, we partner with many different nonprofits that provide everything from financial literacy. Um, we're working on providing micro loans to our workers. We provide health care insurance. We provide uh, food on site, wow. transportation. It's, um, we're extremely highly rated by our workforce. And one of the ways you can guard against, um, I think, 
you know, maybe the pressure to pay as little as possible um, is to actually publish and measure your net promoter score. This is something that's used often in the consumer tech world. The best measure of how well a company is doing is, is how well your clients would recommend it, right? Mm -hmm. If you have a favorite app, you're telling all your friends about it all the time. So interestingly, this is really never done in the social sector. Mm -hmm. I don't know many nonprofits yeah. that have a net promoter score mm -hmm. where you're actually asking your beneficiaries, did you think we did a good job? Did we provide you a valuable service? And so we actually do that with our workforce um, and we publish a lot of this sort of impact data on our site. The second thing I'll mention is the knowledge economy is fundamentally different from, for example, basic manufacturing. When you are working in front of a computer and using the internet and exposed to marketplaces and you know, the idea of, of building an online reputation and when you get a bank account and you're, we actually force our workers to get bank accounts because that means they're part of the formal banking system which provides all sorts mm -hmm. of other benefits. Yeah. Your, um, your life dramatically changes we even have workers start Googling things like what they should be making. <laughs> what is the average salary for someone in Nairobi? You know, it would never have occurred to them to do that if they were working in a factory disconnected from a computer. I think there's a fundamental shift that happens when we move people into the knowledge economy. And thankfully, the data really, really corroborates that. If you look at the trajectory of our workers um, and all this data that we publish, including third-party audits, um, you'll find that they, they tend to stay out of poverty and pretty dramatically so long after they leave Samasource. That's great. So I'm left with a question that uh, is, a, I guess, we come in, in forum tradition, <laughs> but I think it's a very odd question for you uh, because <laughs> I think you've already done it. Uh, the question is, what is your 60-second idea on how to make the world a better place? Well, I actually <laughs> think we know your idea, but actually you have more than one also. Probably your staff is going, oh, no, she's yeah. going to come up with another they one. Are. Yeah. Okay. But um, anyway, do you have some new ideas? Or basically, I think you're making the world a better place on your old ideas. But <laughs> I'll summarize. You know, I think... Um, we're so on, often frustrated by what we see in the media and what our politicians are or not doing. We forget that we vote with our dollars every time a cent leaves our bank account. We are choosing the sort of world we want to live in with the products we buy. When we go to work at our companies, those companies are choosing the sort of world we want to live in by the way they do their procurement. If we can influence how that spend happens, we can literally change the okay. world. Mm -hmm. In South Africa, during apartheid, during a span of three years, um, the UK reduced imports of, Brit of South African textiles by 35% because consumers said, we cannot agree with this unethical regime and we're not going to buy stuff from this regime until they change. Mm -hmm. And they toppled that empire. It happened. So we absolutely have the power to vote every second. And the more we do that as consumers, the better world we're going to live in. Fantastic. All right. Well, let us all uh, thank this inspirational <laughs> powerhouse. That was wonderful. Thanks so much.